You saw the thumbnail, you saw the title. It's about that time. What's up guys, welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm coming back with a very highly requested video. And this video is gonna be about Alia's parents. Yes, Alia's parents. And as we all know, Alia's father, Michael Halton, he unfortunately passed away in 2012. So this is no means to be a disrespectful video. It's just, there's a lot that needs to be talked about. And just to let y'all know, I got an exclusive update on Barry Hankerson, Alia's uncle, and how he's trying to bring Black Iron Records back. I got a lot to tell y'all. And as a disclaimer, I'm going to let y'all know, this is not going to be no disrespectful video to us, our parents. This is not going to be no video bashing out of these parents. I'm not calling them the worst parents in the world. Because let's be honest, we all have our family issues. Maybe not to this degree. But when you look at the state of Aliyah's legacy right now and all the issues around her life and career and the controversies, when you look at that, you got to look at every aspect of Aliyah's life and career. Her parents played a major part in both. So, y'all ready? Let's go. And as y'all can see, I brought a little guest with me, my Aliyah Funko Pop. I did a review on it recently. Huh, you know, she's she's bringing me good energy. So, this video is, is a lot. It took me a while to do this video because as an Aliyah fan, you don't want to feel like you disrespect her parents. I feel like that was a major thing where it's like, you respect Aliyah, you know Aliyah respect her parents, you know they had love for each other. But it's like, when you really dig deep and you look into things, you know, it's a lot of questionable things. It's a lot of mysterious things surrounding her parents. And it's just like, you know, I feel like this is an open discussion. I want to talk to y'all about it. And let's see where y'all heads at with this because it's a lot. It's really a lot. You think you know, you have no idea. So we begin with, we all know back in 1989, Ali was 10 years old on Star Search. This interview of Ali on a late night show talking to the host. And she's talking about being on Star Search and how she was hot at 10 with her nice little dress. And you can see she's being playful. But then she says this. Three and three quarters you were hot at 10 singing I, I My was Funny Valor? You don't understand. Wow. I was hot. I don't think you're supposed to be hot at 10. Are you? <laughs> now let's look at this. Thanks. Comfortable. Uh... Yeah, I totally embrace it. Like I said, I was hot at 10. Right. Right? And I had no sex appeal working back then. And, and, and what, did you, what did your mom used to do? My mother, when I was younger, um, we were um, getting me ready to, uh, you know, come out in the business. I was looking for agents, so she was taking pictures of me. And uh, she said, yo, she's got this kind of sex appeal working. It comes through on, on, on the pictures and yeah. the camera. So, so mom was taking pictures. She, and although we see Ali was being playful and even the host was looking like, mm -hmm, huh? she said about how her mother would take pictures of her and how the mother was like, oh, she has sex appeal at 10 years old. And, and I remember when I first seen that interview, I was kind of like, hmm, that kind of threw me off. But I, you know, being an Aliyah fan, I tried to ignore it. But then I looked through the comments and I seen people putting it out and I was just like, I mean, to be honest, 10 years old and sex appeal in the same sentence, it doesn't, it doesn't connect. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of, that's a question mark. That, that was a question mark. Let's continue. Ended up on her uncle's label, Black Ground Records. At this time, obviously, Aaliyah and R. Kelly had been introduced by her uncle, Barry Hankerson. I made a whole video about him. And R. Kelly comes out with a song called She's Got That Vibe. But listen to these lyrics right here. Hey, yo, R. Kelly, what's up, man? You've been spending a lot of time with this girl. No, man, she just got the vibe, you know what I'm saying? All right, tell me the script. I bet. Songs about basically how he feels a connection supposedly with a woman she's got that vibe they have a connection and you know they want to get to know each other right but at the end he shouts out little cute alia's got it and mind you 1991 alia was 12 years old at this time she's 12 and it's like being on he was on the uncle's label the uncle didn't think that was weird i'm pretty sure alia heard it i'm pretty sure alia's parents heard it they didn't think that was weird that was a little off you know what i'm saying a 12 year, she's 12 years old and you for some reason he felt the need to he felt such a connection to Aaliyah a 12 year old Aaliyah he felt the need to give her a shout out in his song little cute Aaliyah's got it and I remember when I first heard that I was like 
Wow. It was always, it was dead in our faces. But I guess at the time, no, remember, nobody really knew who Aaliyah was because she hadn't come out yet. 1991. Okay. And I guess nobody picked up the red flags. They still let Aaliyah work with him on her album. All right. Then we go into, before she even came out with her album, AJ Nothing But A Number. And that name title right there is, I did a giveaway, like I said. Kelly comes out with Your Body's Calling Remix, 1994. So at this time, Aaliyah is 14. But just listen to these lyrics right here. Time, nobody knew how there was the production was great the vocals were great but your body's calling your body's calling me let's not pretend like we don't know what that song is about Ali is 14 years old basically singing it's like a duet Seren they serenading each other they serenading each other in this song Ali is 14 R. Kelly is in his mid 20s mid to late 20s and I'm pretty sure her parents heard this I'm pretty sure her uncle heard this. Nobody thought this was off, a little weird. Any female vocalist, I know Ali was his protege at the time, but this type of song, like any type of, any female vocalist you could've got, you get a 14 year old Ali to sing this part to you. And y'all heard that, it's just like, like the whole, the tension in the song and the vocals and the lyrics and the delivery is like, wow. Like I said, it was always in our faces. Always, in, it was deliberately, right there but what happened they still let Aliyah work with him for the album now let's get into Diane Horton Aliyah's mother if you didn't know but most fans do Aliyah's mother once upon a time was a singer herself she was trying to make it big in the business but she had gotten pregnant she had already had Rashad but she got pregnant with Aliyah so then she had to put her career on hold and her dreams and aspirations on hold to take care of Aaliyah, you know? And a lot of people, I've seen this theory a lot. A lot of people say, oh, because of that, you know, Diane, Aaliyah's mother, she was living vicariously through Aaliyah. And that's why she was pushing Aaliyah so hard to become a big star, a big artist. And because she couldn't, she had to put her dreams on hold to take care of them. She was pushing so hard for Aaliyah to become this big star. And her brother, Barry Hankinson, Aaliyah's uncle, he had the connections in the music industry and it was just, at the time, it felt like a perfect, it was a perfect opportunity for Aaliyah to just, you know, become a big star, which she did. But then I think of it like this. Ever since she was a little girl, like you see, Aaliyah always said how she wanted to become a singer. And even it's footage of Aaliyah in elementary school singing and playing in Annie. Talking about how she loved to sing and dance and act and everything. So it's not like, it's not a case of like John JonBenet Ramsey. You know, with them beauty pageant queens, where it's like they're six years old, face full of makeup, the frilly, pretty dresses, big curly hair. They don't know what's going on. The stage mothers just send them on stage to look pretty and dance and twirl around and do tricks and stuff for the audience. And it's like they don't have no clue what's going on, but the mother loves it. The stage mother loves it. And it's just like the mother is living vicariously through the daughter. I don't think that was the case with Aaliyah because Aaliyah really wanted this for herself. If anything, she wanted it more than her mother did. Both was pushing Fali to become a big star. She had the support of her parents. And that's what it was. It wasn't like Ali didn't really want to sing. And her mother was like, no, you go, go on this audition, send this demo out, go in the studio with that one. I feel like Ali really wanted this for herself. So now we get to Ali's father, Michael Horton. Michael, he wasn't really too keen on Ali being in the industry, but he know Ali really wanted it, so he supported them, you know? He was kind of, in a way, forced and pushed into this to become her manager. Less. He was her manager at one point. Aliyah's father and mother, at one point, was on her managerial team. As, as she went to elementary school and they had to play, she would be involved in that. She was a little young at that point and began producing, at, uh, producing her at 15, which is when, you know, Robert Kelly and, and uh, my brother-in-law, you know, took her into his uh, label. And uh, I guess the rest is history now. 
family has been involved in this uh, business for a long time. My father's my manager, and my mother's also part of my management team. My um, uncle is the president of my label, so they, they were supportive of me when I said this is what I wanted to do. So you see that, right? Aliyah explains it clearly. Her father and her mother was on her managerial team. So with that, and then you have the, remember when the whole Survivor and R. Kelly thing came out and Aliyah's mother came out with a statement saying, we were always with her. Blah, blah, blah. Some of the only footage we got of Aliyah recording AJ Nothing But A Number is when she's in the studio with R. Kelly by herself. And in that footage, you, and also in that footage, you see it was just R. Kelly and his friends playing cards and dice in the corner while Aaliyah was in the studio singing. Her parents are nowhere in sight. Nowhere to be found. Okay. Let's get into a little more, make it a little more street, all right? All right. Sound good, though, baby. Right. Now y'all playing for food, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do just to get my vibe on. If I can't go to the street, I bring the street for me. I bring my homies in here, set up like it's my crib. I create my music. Just have a little fun with it. We're gonna go, we're gonna do the third verse. We're gonna go through the third verse. You nailed, you didn't just nailed the first and second verse with a hammer. The daughter is becoming this big star, working with R. Kelly, right? All the signs were there. She's got that vibe, your body's calling remix. Y'all still let her work with him. And the whole entire, let's get into how the whole entire album, AJ Nothing But a Number, right? The album is called AJ Nothing But A Number. On the album cover, you have Aaliyah in the front, R. Kelly peeping in the back. He wrote and produced the whole album. And then there's certain songs on that album where I'm like, there's certain songs on that album, knowing what we know now in retrospect, it's like, you know, we all know R. Kelly was creative. He was a great songwriter, producer. But it's like, did he write the songs from his creativity or did he write this out of real emotion? Real emotions he had for Aaliyah. Because look at the titles. The first, first of all, the whole album, they decided to name the whole album Agent Anthem and the Number. The whole marketing strategy was not knowing her age and it's a secret. That whole marketing that whole marketing strategy, that whole marketing ploy was always suspect. It was always off. But the parents were okay with it. Obviously, they let it happen. They let it come out. They approved of it. Barry Higginson, the uncle, was okay with it. Obviously, they, he let it happen. He let it come out. It was his label. Pretty sure they heard the songs. They was they had the photo shoots and everything, the video shoots and everything. They didn't think nothing was wrong, you know. But songs like AJ Nothing But a Number, No One Knows How to Love Me Quite Like You Do, I'm So Into You, Street Thing, I'm Down. It's kind of like you listen to the lyrics, it's like wow, the songs are great, the production is great, Aliyah's vocals are great, but it's like it's like in a way, it's like almost like. R. Kelly writing confessions, but he had Aaliyah singing it. You know what I'm saying? Like, almost like Aaliyah was singing his love letters in a way. Like, I don't know. It's it's weird. And it's like the way the parents being on the team, and I'm pretty y'all was always there with her. Like I said, y'all approved of this. They approved of it. It's like they y'all really approved of this, and y'all let it happen. Aaliyah's 14 when she recorded all this. She's 15 when this is coming out, and. They, it's just like, you look back on it, it's like, wow, how did y'all let this happen? And was y'all always in the studio with them when they was recording? Because another thing is like, if that was the case, how were they, the whole thing with the marriage certificate, let's get into that. How was that able to happen? If y'all was always with Aaliyah, if y'all was on top of her like y'all was supposed to be, watching her like y'all was supposed to be, how was that whole entire controversy able to happen? How was she able to sneak off with him and do this and do that? And that whole entire the whole entire controversy how was that able to happen if that vibe article never came out where it showed the marriage certificate and how Leah changed the age and this and that and this and that would they have still let her work with R. Kelly for the next projects that's a question we may never know you know what I'm saying they was okay with everything the parents Barry Hickerson they were all okay with everything until that Bob article came out and all the controversy came out and then there's, you know, they doing interviews and other thing. R. Kelly, they wear matching outfits and they're going on interviews and even the host of the shows is asking them, do y'all got a thing going on? Like, y'all y'all in the background, I'm pretty sure they all behind the scenes watching. Y'all didn't pick up no red flags, no nothing. It's kind of like, you have to question this now. You know, being a fan, I know it's a tough pill to swallow because you know how much respect Aaliyah had for her parents and everything. But it's just like, wow, 
Y'all just, y'all let a lot slide, didn't y'all? So getting back into Aliyah's father, Michael, the thing with Aliyah's father is he wasn't an industry person. He wasn't an industry dude. He wasn't a street dude. You know how Suge Knight had that power. He had that presence, you know? Aliyah's father, he was like a big guy, but in a way, you know how big guys are like real chill and cool, easy going? He was like a teddy bear. And unfortunately, in this business, you need, if your father, your parents, they're going to be managers of you, you need a hard hitter, heavy goer. You don't got to be like intimidated and intimidating, but you got to be sharp. You got to be keen. You got to have your eyes and ears on everything. And in a sense, looking back on it, it feels like Ali's parents was it. And the thing is, you look back, Diane, Ali's mother, she looked like she didn't play. So it's like, how did you let all this slide, you know? But anyway, back to Ali's father. He, he was just real chill, easy going, and I felt like, in a way, he spoke up when he felt he needed to, but, you know, looking back, obviously, he didn't speak up all the time. Like, I'm going to keep saying, if they were watching Aaliyah like they were supposed to, if they was on top of everything like they were supposed to, that whole controversy would have never happened. Certain songs, I don't think, would have ever happened, and the whole entire, that whole dynamic of the R. Kelly and Aaliyah relationship would have never happened, because... Some parents would have been like, what's going on? Lorel, what's going on? And as I'm sitting here thinking, a lot of theories and a lot of things, people people be going in on Aliyah's parents. This is a major thing that started my idea for this video. People be going in on her parents. But the thing is, it's like, a lot of people say, oh, they sold Aliyah to the industry. Aliyah was their meal ticket and all of that. And I know as fans of Aliyah, you want to defend them because they're Aliyah parents. But when you look back at stuff, sometimes you look back at it, you reevaluate things, and you gotta say to yourself, or at least I say to myself, they made it easy to say that because of their actions or lack thereof, you know? Because you know how you say, oh, this doesn't add up, that doesn't add up, a lot of things don't add up. Sometimes things do add up. It's just that we gotta be willing to solve the equation. If you know what I mean. Sometimes things do add up. But you just have to be willing to solve the equation. Sometimes the answer is right there. You know? I'm going into this because the mysteriousness and the privacy of Halia's parents over the years and back then, it's kind of like, especially with all that was going on, it's, it's really questionable, you know? Because, like I said, just because you're a public figure, that don't mean that you can't have your privacy. Because I like my privacy. I'm pretty sure y'all love your privacy. You know, Aaliyah's parents love their privacy. Aaliyah's, I'm pretty sure that's where Aaliyah got it from. You know, in certain interviews, she would be like, nah, I'm not talking about that. Uh, uh, nah, nah. You know how Aaliyah was if y'all watch her interviews. But it's just like, sometimes, you know, if you're not an open book, even if the book is not cracked open, people are going to write their own pages. And that's what happened. And that's what's happening. You know, because all these years, back then, even now, Aliyah's parents, now Aliyah's mother, they've been so private, so silent, so quiet, and people just feel like, oh, it's guilt, it's this, it's that. And it's like, you know, nobody's coming out, nobody from Aliyah's immediate family is coming out to defend her, say anything, do this. So it's like, people are gonna be like, oh, well, it must be true. You see what I'm saying? And looking back, you do see that Aliyah's parents were with her in her early stages, with the first album promotion, like I said, AJ nothing but a number, they agree with it, they was down with it, they approved of it because they wanted a promotional tour with her. Now, Barry Higginson, bring that here. Y'all remember how I told y'all before? I said I had an exclusive update with Barry Higginson, Aliyah's uncle. He's the main reason why Aliyah's legacy is in shambles. It's kind of rickety, it's kind of shaky. It's not in the best place. It's because of him and his bad business deals, his bad business decisions. He screwed Aliyah over so many times in her career, out of number ones, out of hits, out of Grammys, out of award show performances. Aliyah could have been, she could have been doing a lot more in her career, earlier and faster, but because of his decisions, he messed a lot up. And even now, because of his bad business deals, her music is not on streaming services. We know that, that's the run down, down, da, da, da. We, we already know that, right? But, do y'all know that Barry Hankinson, I got the exclusive for y'all. Do y'all know that Barry Hankinson is trying to revive Black Art Records with this new artist? This new artist named Autumn Marini. 
I'm gonna post the pictures right here. You see, they took this big group photo together. Even her producer, King Damon, he made this big thing, and it was like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna show you the video right here." Troy, uh, T'Challa, uh, Don Deal, What's going on? Anthony Dent, and Grammy. that nigga Grammy. Yeah, he is. yeah, we had uh, the Hankerson Ranch. To make some Grammys. Man, y'all don't even know. They, they got a, over hundred acres in North, Check of course. Out. Now you see that? How he's like, oh. We at the Hankerson Ranch, over 100 acres of land, and you saw the big house in the background, right? Now, from my perspective, most fans thought that Aliyah's uncle was now some old man in a wheelchair, barely able to get around, hiding from the world. But for some reason, he found something in this new artist, Autumn Marini, that he came out of hiding to sign her and try to revive background for. And then there was another post Autumn Marini made on her story where there was all taking shots and having cheers and oh, and then at the end you see this now you see that big bear belly you see the face that's none other than Jomo Hankerson Barry Hankerson's son Aliyah's cousin who was also on Black Round Records and it's like wow Aliyah's legacy is in shambles y'all the main reason why and y'all in here celebrating this new artist and the new artist She's an Aaliyah fan. I said it because she wished her a happy birthday and she even did a cover of one of her songs, Come Over. So to this Autumn Marini girl, I'm like, you're an Aaliyah fan and you don't know the state of her music, her legacy. You don't know that this man that you're signed to or you're trying to sign with, Barry Hankerson, he's the main reason why Aaliyah's legacy is the way it is, why her music is not on streaming services, because of his bad business deals and bad business decisions. Stop the music. Wait, stop the motherfucking music. You, are you dumb? They must be dumb if they think they struck gold signing to him. Because if anything, you struck coal, you struck dirt, you struck mud. Because, you know, nothing's going to come out of this. Autumn, come here, let me tell you something. If he can't even get Aaliyah's music, his own niece, his big superstar niece, Aaliyah, he can't get her music on streaming services. Back then and even now, he don't know what he's doing. He made bad business deals, bad business decisions. What do you think he's going to do for your career in 2021? Just think about that. So just to let y'all know, if y'all wanted to know what Barry Hankerson, Aliyah's uncle, was up to, that's what he's doing. Aliyah's legacy and music is in shambles, and he's signing new artists that do Aliyah covers. And like I said, when I know this video is about Aliyah's parents and their questionable behavior and approval of things, but you really look at it, all the shortcomings in Aliyah's career and the controversies and everything, Barry Hankerson is the root. He's the root of it all. You know how you dig down the soil for a plant and you pull up the root? Barry Hankerson is the root of it all. He's the root of it all. You know, Aliyah's parents, it's kind of, it's question marks all over. But Barry Hankerson, you know, your time will come. You're going to have to, one way or another, you're going to answer for what you did to Aliyah's life and career because... It's ridiculous. And, you know, justice will be served one way or another. Moving on to, you know, after the whole controversy, Aliyah got blackballed and all, all these producers didn't want to work with her. And she was seen as like a, you know, she was like a liability. Like, oh, we don't want to work with her. Uh, uh. But then she found Timbaland and Missy and the rest is history. We know that, right? But then let's move on to the, the 2000s. And obviously you could tell that, you know, the late 90s, 2000s, you could tell that Aliyah still had a great relationship with her mother. Oh, very proud of her, you know. She wouldn't have to do this for me to be proud of her, but this just adds to it, Thank you know. You, I'm proud of everything she does. She's a beautiful, lovely young woman. Thank you, Mama. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. 
But then we get to August 25th, 2001. And here's where, you know, things are going to take a shift. And I'm about to get real deep with this, you know? Because it's like, y'all know, y'all know. Alia, just imagine, you know, Alia went to the Bahamas to do this music video. She was in Miami. And mind you, at this time, this was like their first video shoot that they didn't go on with, you know? They all her other videos, like Rashad had said before, they had was on behind the scenes, they was doing this, they was doing that, they was there with her. This was the one time they chose not to go or they couldn't go because they had obligations. But at this time, mind you, Aliyah was 22. She was grown. She went with her crew. And like I said, y'all know Aliyah's crew and her makeup people, her team, they were her friends. So, you know, they felt like, all right, it is what it is. You know, you all come back in a few days, handle our business, have family time. Just imagine, you know, Aliyah went to the Bahamas on this day. And then two days later, two, three days later, you get a phone call saying that, she passed in a plane crash. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just thinking about it from their perspective. Just them getting that phone call. Knowing that two days ago, Ali was fine, probably calling them, oh yeah, I'm uh, shooting her video, having a nice vacation with her crew. And then you get a call saying that she passed in a plane crash. And then not only that, here's, I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this, thinking about this. From my understanding, Aliyah, parents, and Rashad, her brother, they had to fly down to the Bahamas to identify her body. You don't know what state it's going to be in. You know she was just in a plane crash. And then you got to fly down to the Bahamas to identify her body. That is just like, it's, it's unfathomable. I, I can't even put together the words. I can't even put together the thoughts of how that must have been for them. You know what I'm saying? Because you know what I feel like? You know how, if you ever been to a viewing, you ever been to a funeral, you know how it is. You know how you get that anxiety, you get anxious, you get that feeling before you got to go in and see the, you know, you see your loved one, you see your family member, you see your friend in that state. So just imagine what they had to go through. You know what I'm saying? And, oh my God, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I feel like that pain that pain, that's a trauma and that's a pain that will never go away, you know? It's gonna never go away. It's another thing, right? And no way am I saying that Ali's parents were supposed to go on some promotional grief tour talking about the trauma and pain they felt from losing their big famous superstar daughter. Because at the end of the day, to us, Ali was this famous singer, you know, we liked her, we liked her music, we thought she was pretty, we liked her personality, but Ali was their daughter. Ali was Rashad's sister. You know, and at the end of the day, you know, we got to separate that being a fan and being a family member. It's a completely different thing, completely different perspective that only they would know, you know. But my thing is, it's like, I feel like in a way, after everything happened, you know, they they kind of dropped the ball on continuing Aliyah's legacy. They tried, they tried to hold it up for that first year and a half or two, a few months. You know, her posthumous I Care For You album came out. And then after that, you know, Rashad tried to, you know, I feel like they put so much pressure on Rashad to continue everything. Her parents were just like, you know, and even I did the video about Aaliyah's Manhattan condo. It took them like nine years to even sell it. They held on to her condo for nine years before they sold it in 2010. So it's just like, I just imagine the pain and trauma they felt. But it's like, at some point, you got to realize it's like, you know, I guess your daughter wasn't just an ordinary woman. She was a big superstar. She, in a way, she died working, trying to do a video. So in a way, I feel like, you know, you gotta let her legacy continue. You gotta approve things, let things happen. I feel like in a way, they just left it to Rashad and they said, forget that, forget her singing career, forget this, forget that. And they just, you know, because look at this. You know what, I look at it like this. After Selena was murdered, her family went on Oprah. They had this big tell-all, talk about this, talk about that. And they were just talking about that and really trying to promote Selena's legacy and trying to continue it and talk about that tragedy, but also talk about like, okay, now if we want Selena to be remembered for this, for, for being remembered for that, right? Same thing with Biggie. Biggie and his mother. Tupac and his mother. Left Eye and her family. I'm just thinking of all the different examples. 
But with Aaliyah, it was kind of like they left it to Rashad and her parents was just like, oh, forget it. I don't want to talk about it. You know, that's it's just like, wow. In a way, it's like they forgot that your daughter is a big superstar who had a career. She still has a legacy that needs to continue. And it's like they just forgot about that, you know. And I get it. The pain and trauma, we will never know. We will never know. But it's like at the end of the day, Aaliyah died working. I don't want her death. You didn't want her death to be in vain for her legacy to be forgotten because you don't approve of this, because you don't come out to talk about this. And I respect the privacy. I know about the privacy, but it's like at the end of the day, something gotta something gotta come and something gotta click where it's like, okay, I, I'm sad, I'm grieving, the pain, the trauma, but I also gotta finish my daughter's legacy. I also gotta continue my daughter's legacy. But, you know, from my understanding, the only interview I've ever seen Aliyah's mother do, or even her uncle, Barry Hankerson, do about Aliyah after her death was she had a, on VH1, she had a behind the music. I remember they did interviews for that. After that, that was it. And they even popped out at a few events in Aliyah's honor, too. But you notice how Aliyah's father wasn't there? I noticed after Aliyah's death, after the funeral, you don't see no pictures of Aliyah's father nowhere. Like you go to Google, you can't really see no, you know, pictures from the after 2001 of her father. Now, on a rare occasion, fans were running to him when they was visiting Aliyah's mausoleum. As for like, you know, eventually, unfortunately, you know, Aliyah's father ended up passing away too, and now they're together. But in a way, I feel like, no, I know, I feel like Aliyah's father passed with a broken heart and he passed with all that trauma. And, you know, a lot of people say they were guilty. They feel guilt. They feel guilt. That's why they, they're so private. That's why they didn't do this. That's why they didn't do that. And, you know, like I said, I said, as an Aliyah fan, you want to defend and you want to say this, you want to say that. But the tough pill to swallow is they made it easy for people to think that and they made it easy for people to say that because you just start you just look up everything. You stack everything together. You just be like, wow, there's it's no way to really defend this, you know? It's like mysterious. That's the mystery of Ali's parents. Mysterious. We know. We, we know. Now, I know. From my understanding, you can tell. You know they had love for each other. You know Ali had love for them. You know they had love for Ali. But something in that 1994, 1995 era is... And then even after her death, it's a lot of questionable behavior. A lot of questionable behavior. My thing, and even with the Surviving R. Kelly and the Lifetime movie, y'all don't come out, y'all don't speak out, y'all don't come out and do interviews. You know, Rashad, he tries, but he like he doesn't, he he's only gonna do so much too, you know? Like I feel like at certain feel like at a certain point, you gotta come out of that hiding and be like, you know, protect your sister's name, protect your daughter's name, protect her legacy, you know, stand up for it, speak out for it. You just let this happen, let this happen, let that, you letting this one say this, you letting this one say, oh, she saw, I saw them on the tour bus doing this, you letting this one say that. This is like, who has Aliyah's back? Besides the fans, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know how I, y'all know how I do. But it's like, at this point, I feel like all Aliyah has is the fans. And, you know, after all that, Thinking about it, and thinking about it, you know, I took it. I have to take it easy on Rashad in a way because it's like, um, he is trying, he is picking it up because you know, for a while we didn't have nothing. He is picking it up, and you know how I get on the estate. I'm like, y'all gotta do this, gotta do that, do this better, do that better. With all the pain and all the trauma that he probably still feels from Aliyah's passing. You know, I follow him on Instagram and Twitter and all that, and it's like, okay, you know. He's trying his best, and you know, like I said, look, we got this Funko Pop, we got the shirts, we got, you know, all these different things that came off our Leah. But it's just like, the silence, you know, in a way, the silence, silence in itself, speaks volumes. And really, the whole basis of this video is because over the years, especially after the Lifetime movie, and after the Survivor Kelly, 
I've seen so many just go in on I've seen so many people just go in on her parents and bash them and ah ah everybody felt her nobody had her back nobody looked out for her nobody had her best interest her parents sold her you know Aliyah was their meal ticket and the hardcore Aliyah parents you want to defend them because they're Aliyah parents but when you really step back and you look back you look closely you look deeply you swallow that tough pill without no water sometimes you just gotta you just gotta look at it and be like their questionable and mysterious behavior and their silence and their lack of action made it easy for people to say that you know and at that point it is what it is and you know all that's left now is from Aliyah's immediate family that we know of is Rashad and Diane. Aliyah's now with her father. And, you know, at this point, you know, I said all that because it was just on my mind and I wanted to have this discussion because it's just like, if Aliyah's parents were on it like they were supposed to be, this wouldn't, all of this would have never happened. The whole controversy, the whole, that whole, that would have never happened. That's what took me so long to do this video because I was like, People are going to be like, oh, how are you an Aaliyah fan? And you you're talking this about her parents. But when you really look at it, you just got to be like. And when I look back on things, I feel like in a way, Aaliyah's parents, they put too much trust into Barry Hankerson. They were not really industry people like that. So in a way, they left it all in the hands of Barry Hankerson. Even to this day, that whole first album controversy, the whole R. Kelly situation, it will always troll behind Aaliyah's name. And that pisses me off. And as much as fans want to fight against that, there's really nothing we can do because it happened 25 years ago. People still going to be talking about it. Five, 10 years from now, people still going to be talking about it. And it's just like, if they wanted to put that much trust into Barry Higginson, if Barry Higginson was in his right mind, if they was really on top of things that they were supposed to be, none of that would have never happened. And all we could do as fans as a fans, all we could do now is uplift Aliyah's legacy in the best way possible. It's even to the point where now you see even MTV, MTV, every few weeks, they drop in new clips of Aliyah like, oh, her state didn't do nothing yet? Oh, well, let's drop another clip. Like, even MTV is like, damn, okay, let's drop another Aliyah clip. Like, we got to get Aliyah's legacy and name out there for this new generation, for our generation. So 20 years from now, in 2041, 2042, in 2040, Aliyah's name will still ring bells. People still going to be talking about her all around the world. So I just want to give a shout out to all the fans around the world who's ever stuck up for Aliyah, who's ever did anything for Aliyah, who's ever made a tribute for Aliyah, who's ever did anything in their creative power, in their creative mind, in their creative talent to uplift Aliyah's legacy and to really get her name out there and to continue her legacy. And I'm glad I have this channel because it's like, like I said, it's, it's an Aaliyah hub for all the fans to come and discuss these type of issues and things within Aaliyah's life and career that so many people shy from talking about. This is like, no. At this point, this year is going to make 20 years since Aaliyah transitioned. We got to go hard for her this year. But I just wanted to give that breakdown, give that spill, because that's something that always... It always... I was always, that's something I was always curious about. And I want to know y'all opinions on it. What did y'all think about Aliyah's parents? What do y'all think about the whole situation with the first album, the controversy? Like, what are y'all feelings on that? What are y'all thoughts on that? And most importantly, in what ways do you think we can move on from that? In what ways do you think Aliyah's estate can really fulfill Aliyah's legacy, fulfill her goal, fulfill her promise from being remembered as a good person and a full entertainer? without that controversy always following behind her name, you know? I know this is my second time recording this video. The first time it was so much technical difficulties and I feel like, is this a sign that I shouldn't post this? But y'all know how I do. I'm all about being honest and not being so biased to where I'm like, oh no, 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 it can't be, it can't be. The most important thing is uplifting Aaliyah's legacy and really celebrating her legacy. Making sure Aliyah's name will always be remembered, making sure her legacy is always remembered, and making sure Aliyah's death doesn't go in vain. You know? And at this point, 
I know everybody's watching. Every all the true fans out there, y'all gonna make sure Aliyah will always reign supreme. So, anyways, guys, please let me know your thoughts down below. I cannot wait to interact with y'all. I know this is gonna be a crazy comment section. You know, try to you know keep it keep it keep it PG. <laughs> I know this is going to be a crazy comment section. I'm going to meet y'all in the comments. Let's talk about this. Let's get this discussion started. And let's really, you know, let's give our ideas, give our opinions, give our perspectives. Keep it respectful in a way that's not overboard. You know, tell your truth, tell your opinion, tell your perspective. But, you know, let's keep it at a certain level. And let's move on from this and keep celebrating Aaliyah in the best way we know how, you know? So anyways, guys, please don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, and hit the notification. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see y'all in the next video.